This episode is brought to you in part by Reliance AI. Reliance AI streamlines privacy, data protection, and AI governance on one platform with advanced AI for live data mapping, processing activity records, and more. Visit reliance.ai, that's R-E-L-Y-A-N-C-E dot A-I. It's in the code. Welcome back to another episode of Data Protection Gumbo. I am your host, Demetrius Malbro, and today we have a great episode lined up for you where I have a, an opportunity to have a conversation with Daniel Barber, who is the CEO of DataGrail, and i um, looking forward to this conversation today. Daniel, how are you? Great, Demetrius. Yeah, looking forward to it. Why don't you start off by giving us a brief rundown of Data Grail and a short snippet around founding the company? Yeah, sure thing. So my name is Daniel Barber, um, co-founder and CEO of Data Grail. We uh, founded Data Grail back in 2018 at the peak of you know privacy. Uh, but I'd say my background, uh, I've been in data products and third-party applications for a better part of a decade. And uh, you know, prior to Data Gray, I kind of watched two large trends in the market. One with you know just an increasing use of of software and businesses expanding their use of software, typically buying software that you know processes personal information and that not slowing down, right? So just businesses continuing to advance in their ability to use software. And on the other side, consumers' expectations around privacy. And I think that, you know, these two things, unfortunately, don't line up. And so I think, you know, the modern enterprise really was looking for solutions to address privacy and specifically provide consumers like you and me privacy rights and provide capabilities to adhere to those. And so, yeah, we founded the business in 2018, have seen great success since that point. We've now you know, about 30% of our customers are publicly traded mm -hmm. brands from Salesforce to restoration hardware to Instacart and everything in between. And uh, yeah, I was excited to spend some time with you today to talk about the journey and where we see the market going. Then I, I really want to dive into understanding a little bit about consumer consent, because if you think about it, it's, it's something that you don't really think about on a daily basis. I, I mean, you just kind of working on your laptop or you're just going about your digital business, right? And you're you're not thinking about some of the different types of consent that are already implied. So I really want to get your experience just around why you think consumers are often unaware of what, what they are consenting to online, especially when it comes to things like cookies and, and also data tracking. Yeah. Yeah. So great question. And I think it's a great topic for us to talk through. So, you know, taking a step back first, just looking at like the landscape across Europe and across the U S mm -hmm. uh, there's a slightly different structure between the two, right? So in Europe, you have this concept of default opt out, meaning, you know, you're really, if you're a European citizen or European resident, you have more control perhaps over data that's retrieved or processed by a, a business. When you arrive at a business, they actually must collect your consent before they process any personal information. And so that's a different sort of structure and framework than what we have in the US. First, we have this concept of default opt-in. So businesses are able to collect personal information on you, regardless of whether they do business with you or you do business with them before you interact with the company. And so with that backdrop, it's a pretty challenging environment, right? You've got... Right. Businesses deploying, you know, potentially hundreds of different software applications on a website, for example, if they've got a mobile application, this increases the complexity even further. And then, you know, you've got in-store interactions as well. If perhaps they've got a, a storefront where you're visiting the, the actual store and perhaps the company's collecting location information on you as you interact or, you know, get close to a, a store location. And so mm -hmm. with that backdrop, it's a, it's a challenging environment. If you think about, you know, chief privacy officers or chief information security officers, they're trying to assess one, what are all the applications that we actually use mm -hmm. um, and you know, what type of information is being collected by those applications. And then how is, you know, how is personal information being processed by those applications as well? And then just to compound that problem even further, now we have, you know, AI and specifically generative AI used on websites. And so, right. You know, 
third party software might be processing your information, but passing it to, you know, potentially uh, generative AI models that are processing your information even further. And mm. so with that backdrop, we, we've spent a lot of time thinking about the problems that, that businesses encounter and consumers are looking to, to see when they experience brands that they interact with. And I would say it's, it wasn't surprising, but, you know, sort of stands out that when we looked at the top 5,000 websites, we actually found that, you know, 75% of websites, when you visit the, the homepage and you perhaps select that you don't want your information to be tracked, uh, businesses still actually are not able to restrict that function. Mm, they do uh, it anyway. Yeah. And that's, that's not by design, right? That's okay. not likely intentional. It just shows and highlights how difficult this problem is um, for modern businesses because they, you know, inherently use a large number of different tracking services to personalize the experience for you and I, but that leads to a challenge to try to restrict the tracking and the processing of that personal information and really adhere and honor the rights that you and I expect when we visit a website. Now, is most of this around GDPR? Because it, it sounds quite like GDPR. I remember several years ago when it was a hot topic and we were putting systems in place in order to make sure that people could opt out and we were able to remove certain bits and pieces of inf information and then also respond back to them and let them know, yes, your information has been removed or if they need a copy of their data, then you could actually supply them with that. Is that is similar to that? It's, it's related. Yeah. Related. So on that, on that framework that we talked about earlier. So that kind of default opt out structure, right? Businesses can't process your personal information without your consent in the EU. In the US, you know, the CCPA, so California's regulation mm -hmm. uh, led the way in 2020, passed in 2018. Now we're approaching about 20 US states where similar type of regulatory changes have been made, but they mostly follow the CCPA sort of framework, which is this default in opt in structure. Now with that, what that really provides is this concept to opt out to the sale or share of your personal information. Now mm -hmm. that creates additional challenges actually beyond those of the GDPR. So the GDPR, when you think about a business, they don't have the ability to process your personal information unless you provided explicit consent. But in the US, you can opt out to the sale or share of your personal information. Now, that includes things that might extend beyond what you may associate as coming to a website, right? So loyalty programs, for example, where you know perhaps you're in a, a travel program and that program has a loyalty program, your information might be shared with other third parties that hmm. are not just websites, um, or I should say not just applications on the website, but you know, could provide additional services that perhaps complement why you're visiting the website, right? So mm. maybe you're going to a travel website and you're looking at a holiday, they might share your personal information with airlines who then would use that information to you know, retarget you or potentially perform marketing activities. And so you can imagine this extends to retailers who might collect your loyalty of you know, your purchase behavior and the type of things that you're purchasing. That information might be shared and no monetary exchange technically takes place. But consumers now in the US, particularly in California and other states as well, can request the businesses stop that processing. So stop the share or sale of personal information. And that's that's a quite a difficult thing to address when you mm -hmm. think about the information might be shared with potentially hundreds of third parties. Okay. Yeah, that's it sounds really scary because uh, one thing that I'm thinking about what are what are some of the dangers, right? So we are giving our information up freely. We've been doing it. If you want a a white paper, you want to download some content or you want to watch a webinar or anything, everyone's asking for your information. But what are some of the dangers if an enterprise or an organization there sharing your information without without your consent so as the ceo of that company what, what are some of the the regulations or laws that can can actually um, go wrong with that particular ceo if they happen yeah. to not get it right yeah i mean look it is challenging i'd say you know the particular information that is sensitive so by sensitive personal information i mean things like healthcare information 
that, as we know, within the US has an extended sort of piece of coverage with HIPAA, mm -hmm. but the, that location information combined with healthcare information can become very sensitive, right? Particularly the changes that we saw with Roe versus Wade last year and, you know, what that means from a, you know, standpoint of sensitive information. So if individuals information is being shared with third parties, potentially advertising providers or other providers, and if that information can be connected to location information, that can be very challenging, right? And so for us or a case last year where the California Attorney General issued a fine and, you know, that really was a result of location information being shared specific to the CCPA, simply because, you know, if, if people do have an app or they have an ability to track location information, that becomes a challenge. And businesses need to set up effective mechanisms to allow consumers to opt out of that information being shared. Okay. And hopefully, if they are opting out, they are really opting out. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's the yeah. key point, right? And it's, it's very hard. We released a solution, you know, in, in June, so June 25th, mm -hmm. uh, we put a, a consent solution in market to address this challenge because frankly, we saw kind of existing solutions weren't able to do, like I described earlier, what businesses really need. Um, but it is a challenging place. And I yeah. think leading up to the election, I'm sure you've received countless text messages already on, you know, people trying to get your support for, for election contributions. And, you know, those are without your consent, right? Because again, we are default opt in. So they can, they can try to perform marketing activities to you. But part of that, you must be able to opt out to those activities because that is, you know, the sale or sharing of personal information needs to be restricted and protected for consumers. So you mentioned just releasing something in June. And so if you released something around this, so obviously there was a challenge or a problem. Now, was this more of a manual type process? Let's say someone wants to opt out and you're the CIO and you're trying to figure out, okay, if someone opts out, how do we actually take them out of the system or we don't collect information? I mean, how challenging or difficult was that before you guys tackled this, this issue? Yeah, I mean, you know, clearly existing providers exist in the market, right? Mm -hmm. And those 5,000 websites, and we found 75% of them are actually not doing what they're trying to do. Um, okay. There is a need for a, a new solution. And so um, DataGrail Consent is the product we released um, June 25th to, to start to address that. I would say that, you know, it's it's still challenging, right? So the product now provides ease of use for people to deploy it to their website and restrict the tracking of services that might be sharing or selling personal information, but also providing, you know, provisions for Europe, for example, as we talked about earlier with the GDPR, where, you know, if you're visiting a site in Europe, you do need to provide explicit consent and collect explicit consent in order to process someone's information at all. So that's, that's the product that we released. It is a next generation solution. So we evaluated the market for frankly years. Uh, before we went and released our own product because we wanted to make sure that it actually works to the conversation we're having earlier. Mm, okay. And all the way back in, in the beginning, you mentioned generative AI and AI and right. It's, it's like you can't have an episode without throwing around those buzzwords today. Where do you see AI being utilized even today and also in the future as it pertains to consent and compliance and privacy? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I think within consent, it, it opens up a new world, right? So what do I mean by that? Well, you know, if you were to visit a website, you know, keeping with the travel theme and perhaps the website has a chat bot, right? And the chat bot is trying to help you facilitate services to book a new trip or book a travel um, experience. And if that chat bot is using generative AI, um, it may collect your personal information. It would process your personal information mm -hmm. and information may be shared with a third party that you're not aware of, right? And so could be used for profiling purposes in ways you're not aware. And so okay. there is a world where consent is collected um, for the use of AI services. I think that businesses today are frankly moving fast um, with, with their use of AI and, and that's great. That'll advance business. 
but you know, ensuring that the appropriate safeguards are installed ultimately gives the consumer confidence that, hey, like if I do interact with this particular travel site to book a, a flight or a hotel or an experience, um, my data is protected uh, and I'm informed of how it's being processed, right? Which I think ultimately we're talking about transparency. That's what people are really looking for. Yeah. Um, but but that is quite difficult to do. So, you know, even just understanding which third parties you're installing on your website are using AI, um, this is this is quite hard to do. Now we have a solution there too, um, but this is, this is not an easy problem. And uh, the modern enterprise is moving quickly to adopt generative AI, which is again, great for business mm -hmm. um, and great for the consumer. It will provide a better personalized experience, but providing that transparency and ultimately providing control and, and choice around you know how data is used builds trust and will build more loyalty for businesses as they look to you know impl implement ai in in creating okay. and you you've already mentioned a a few things that were some great insight but what, what are some of the most often and overlooked aspects of let's just say data privacy in general that you believe more companies should be paying attention to? Yeah, so I mean, AI is obviously one of them, right? I think that like, I would have to highlight that point at this stage, right? Um, mm -hmm. Companies are using generative AI in their business um, more frequently than, than they were in the past. Um, that is a common phenomenon, we see that. And so businesses trying to understand, you know, what type of applications are processing personal information and how. But I would say the... The issue was never really solved on shadow IT. And that's a thing mm -hmm. that, you know, businesses continue to struggle with, particularly in the realm of privacy, right? So if you look at, for example, Okta's data, so Okta is a, a single sign-on solution. It's a, you know, identity management platform that you're right. familiar with. You know, businesses that use Okta, for example, if they've been using that tool for four years, they probably have about 200 systems that they've connected to Okta to ensure that employees are safely and securely accessing those applications. But, you know, data from Netscope, um, which is a, a, a software that looks at um, the network and can understand what types of applications are actually in use at the business. Data from Netscope suggests that number is actually closer to 1500. So if that is true, right, and obviously the data is accurate, this suggests that really the business may have you know, over a thousand different applications that it's not aware of, right? Mm -hmm. How data is being processed in those applications really does matter because if the consumer is to our earlier, you know, points looking to opt out or looking to understand what data is collected or looking to delete the data that has been collected, you know, a comprehensive view of all of the applications that exist and how that those applications are processing personal information is required to really, you know, advance the privacy program and, and build yeah. trust with the consumer. Okay, great, fantastic. And I always like to ask this question, Daniel, because there's often some college students or someone who's, you know, computer science major, data scientist, and you know the job market has been quite yeah. challenging right yeah. now, right? Yeah. A lot of layoffs happen post COVID and you see 10% yeah. here, 15% there, and people are also unhappy and they're trying to change. And so yeah. it's just a different ball game right now, as far as uh, looking or changing um, jobs, because there's just so many qualified candidates out there. Yep. And what advice would you give to a college student who let's say is graduating in the spring of next year, and they want to go into, let's say data science, right. Or some other field that's adjacent into this whole privacy and consent and compliance area. What advice would you give to them overall? Yeah, it's a great question. I, I love that you asked it because I think it, you know, thinking about um, our next leaders and people who are, you know, joining businesses is, is really important. I think, you know, in internships are, should not be underrated, right? I think today they, they often are and yeah. folks look at them as, you know, maybe I don't, I don't want an internship. I want a full-time job. I think that, you know, when you're early in your career, you are really trying to figure out who you are. And, you know, the easiest thing is what, what actually do you enjoy doing, right? Mm. That, that may seem easy when you ask that question, but you don't know until you get in the workforce. And so I think not being afraid to, to move forward with internships and look for internship opportunities because 
one, you then get exposed to the business, which is important and, you know, in the workforce interacting with others, but you also start to figure out like, what do you actually enjoy? Your working is something you're going to put, you know, a good significant amount of your day and your life in, into your work. And so if you're doing that, you want to find something that is gratifying, rewarding, and ultimately you enjoy doing. So, you know, I would say, you know, folks looking for full-time jobs, if they're struggling in that area, don't be scared to try out internships, especially if you're you know, a junior and you're not in your senior year yet. Try to get experience and get real working experience so that you can understand you know, business, but also just simply understand what you enjoy doing. And that helps really sort of focus your efforts to ensure that you are landing in the right opportunity. Because again, when you're early in your career, you just don't know. There's so many unknown unknowns. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, exposing yourself to, to work in an internship capacity gives you a flavor for what the type of work could be and would help you assess whether that's something you want to put all of your effort in, um, as you look at for, you know, a full-time job. I, I appreciate that insight. And l let's say one of them want to come work for data grail. What, what type of position would you guys have at data grail? Yeah, so we, we have a, a strong internship program. I think we have about three or four interns right now, across marketing, across engineering. Across, Thank you for that. Um, other areas in the business. So that's the thing we do. One, because I just, I believe in that type of program. But, you know, I think second, we're always hiring in engineering, in sales, in marketing, mainly across the business. Okay. Uh, so certainly, you know, keep a lookout on our job board. The other thing that we offer for the community, so we have a, a community of about 300 uh, privacy professionals in our Slack community. So that's something mm -hmm. to check out on our website. And it's very attractive for people who are looking for work because there are a lot of senior leaders in that group that are looking for talent. So it's a good marketplace mm -hmm. to engage there. And we have a job site on our um, homepage as well that is regularly updated with you know, privacy related jobs. So those would be a few places I would suggest to start. All right. Daniel, thank you so much for sitting down with us today here on Data Protection Gumbo. Really appreciate the insight around consent and privacy and just uh, everything that you shared with us right here on, on the show. But before I let you go, I do want to let the, the Gumbo listeners know about the Backup and Recovery Professionals LinkedIn group. There are 26,000 professionals all around cybersecurity data protection, compliance, regulations. I mean, the list goes on, right? There's so many individuals and uh, talented professionals in that group as well. So go to LinkedIn, search groups. It's called Backup and Recovery Professionals. Type that in. I am the creator of that group, so I will gladly let you in. So you can also take place in, in conversations as well around these topics. So Daniel, once again, thank you so much for being a guest here. Love it. Appreciate the time, Demetrius, and look forward to talking soon.